and he's going to share with us some observations about the peacemaking process, specifically the peacemaking process between Israel and Palestine. Hi, so, uh, so like Josh said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a parent here. My daughter, Sage, is in the third grade. Um, but I'm very happy to be here to speak to you. I have been a diplomat for the last 14 years, and the last 10 of which I've been focused on promoting democracy, human rights, and conflict resolution. So I worked, uh, I was just in, I'm in Afghanistan right now, as so we're trying to bring some peace and stability to Afghanistan. Before that, I was in Sri Lanka, running democracy and helping them heal after the war. Um, and I've also worked on uh, the peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians for three years, and then before that in, in Sudan. So I thought I would share with you a little bit of what I've learned about being a diplomat and getting peace, and a little bit about the Israelis' peace process. So I'm a, I'm a diplomat. And diplomacy is making an argument. Basically, what we do as a diplomat is we talk to people and we convince them to do things that uh, they wouldn't necessarily otherwise do. We just sort of convince them by talking, which I always think seems a little strange. Like, if I didn't know anything about diplomacy, if I sort of lived in a cave and then I'd explain to someone, they're like, so you just talk to them and you convince them to do things? It's like, yeah, pretty much. Like, well, can you threaten them or you know, give them money to do what you want? Not really, not usually. Usually we just talk to them. And the way that we talk to them is we, we make an argument. And, uh, and the argument convinces them. And there are some characteristics of an argument. So a diplomatic message has to be clear. Has to, people have to really understand it. Has to be short. Because longer messages, sometimes the details get lost and people can't really uh, remember it. You want them to remember your argument has to be true. There's a power to the truth that uh, is really actually quite exceptional. If you say something that's true, uh, it's out there and it can't really be unsaid, and it's, it's very powerful, especially if it's clear and short. Uh, there's a power to the truth. And it has to be, but it has to be from a credible source. They have to believe the person that's, uh, that's telling them the truth. And so as a diplomat, the most important thing that I have is my credibility, is me telling the truth. And because people have to believe me. They say diplomacy is about relationships, but there's different kinds of relationships. Some diplomats make friends with people because you're more likely to believe somebody that you're friends with, you believe your friends when they talk to you. Uh, I usually take more of an approach of, like, you say things that people respect, and, and if, you, if you say things that people know are true, then they get comfortable with what you say is true, so you have a relationship built on that level of, of respect. There are other kinds of relationships. A lot of times when we're doing peace negotiations, we choose somebody really famous to be the lead, uh, really respectful, like a former senator, or sometimes former president. And that's because there's a relationship based on that. that you know, if you're a former president, as soon as you walk into the room, people will respect what you have to say and listen to what you have to say. So they make uh, famous people who are famous for doing good things make good envoys. And then you have to repeat it frequently. And that's the key. Just saying something once, people might not remember what they might think about it. So when I go out to make an argument, I, uh, I will say it to, I've been in meetings with presidents of countries, and we've delivered the message. And then we say the same message in a in a press release to the to the media, the ambassador will go on television and say it. And then I'll say it to people that sort of that I work with at my level, and then I'll even just say it to people at the streets. And I'll just repeat it over and over again. And my hope is that at some point they'll be in a room making a decision. And somebody will be like, well, what do you think we should do? I say, well, the Americans thought this would be a good idea. And then somebody else says, Oh yeah. That does sound like a good idea. Somebody else told me that was a good idea. And then someone else is like, I've heard that was a good idea. And they don't know it also came from us, came from the United States. But it's been bouncing back and forth. And then they, all on their own, come to making the, uh, the right decision. So we want to be clear, short, true, be credible, and repeat it frequently. We'll do a little exercise. Do I have a volunteer? Give you your hand up. Shot first. Come on to the front. So I brought, as uh, Rabbi Josh said, I'm living in Afghanistan now. So 
I brought some uh, lapis lazuli pebbles from uh, Afghanistan. Does anybody know what lapis lazuli is? Anybody heard of it? It's a, it's a stone. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty blue stone. And it is only found in Afghanistan. It's the only place in the world. But it's very famous for a very long time. They, they traded far. King Tut's Mask has some polished blue uh, lapis lazuli in its, in its decorations. So uh, it's a very famous stone. I'm going to all right, so she's got some lapis lazuli. Now, we want to come up with an argument that'll convince her that it's the right thing to do to share. So, anybody have some ideas for arguments? Um, well, you have all that with you. You're going to share it with someone else. You're going to have one at least, so why not just share it? Okay, that's, that's not bad. What do you think? Does that make you want to share? Yeah. Oh, you're, you're very nice. <laughs> not all people are fortunate to get it. So you should think about others, and if you were unfortunate enough, would you want it? Yeah, I figured it. Does that sound good to you? There you go. And that's, and that's something important to remember. In a lot of our arguments, to get governments to do something, governments are just made up of people. And they make this, and people are making the decisions. And people want to be liked, and they want to be respected, and they want to be thought of as nice people. And so if you can sort of talk to them, and convince them that doing something that other people will see them as a nice person or a good person if they do it. It's actually a good argument that we make even the governments. Um, you could say it's very rare and you have so many of them, so it would be nice to share them around to bring culture to other people. Ah, sharing your culture, that is a, that's a good idea. And you hit on an important point. Uh, people like to be flattered. So if you sort of, you know, if you talk about how much you like somebody's culture, then they're going to be more likely to want to share with you. So that's a really good one. All right, so we talked about uh, love peace and pursue peace. This is another Rabbi Hillel quote. Everybody, anyone familiar with this one? Yeah. It's, it's part of a full quote. Right. Do people know the rest of the quote? Anyone know? Uh, you guys know the end of the quote. Sure. Yeah. You know the end of the quote? If not now, when? Yeah. If I'm not for others, what am I? If I'm not for myself, who am I for? I'm not for others, what am I? This is a lot of what we do in, in peacemaking, is we're trying to help others. And so, and this is one of the reasons why I, I became a diplomat, because if I'm not trying to help others, then what am I trying to do? I also have a few quotes from, from Martin Luther King Jr. that uh, inspire me. So anyone heard this one before? Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yeah. And I, I really believe this, I believe that uh, we have a responsibility to, to fight injustice in the world so everyone can be just. When I'm, when I'm out making peace, I, I tell people in Afghanistan all the time, I'm, I'm here to help bring peace to Afghanistan, not just for you, but also for myself and so that me and so that my, my daughter and, and all my children can grow up in a better world. I want, you know, we want to find, fight justice wherever it is, fight injustice wherever it is, and bring justice. And then here's another quote that I also really like. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Remember, the king said this a few times in different ways. He didn't originate this. It came from an abolitionist in the 19th century. What do people think this means? Um, I think it means that people might not think that they're doing something wrong, but Basically, that, that the world is getting to be better all the time. That there's more and more justice in the world. That's sort of what you're saying. That, you know, if you think about it, you know, a couple hundred years ago, we had slavery in this country. People that weren't free, that was an injustice, but it's better now. You know? And I, Martin Luther King said this a few times in slightly different ways. I took this exact one from a sermon that he delivered at Temple Israel in Hollywood in 1965. Because justice equals peace. Peace equals dignity. And what I mean by this is, they, you may have heard, they say war is the worst thing. And 
war is really, really terrible. I've seen enough of it to know that I would like to not see it anymore. But it is not the worst thing. Because if it's the worst thing, nobody would do it. The very worst thing is having to live without justice, to have to live without dignity. So when we're trying to make peace, our goal is to try to bring justice, bring justice to that part of the world, and to allow people to live in dignity. All protracted conflicts, all long conflicts, at the end, they're about dignity. There are other parts of it. There's, you know, people talk about they're fighting over land, they're fighting over this, they're fighting over that. But that's just the scorecard for what people are using for dignity. That's something a lot of diplomats don't realize. So if you guys remember this, you'll be uh, pretty far ahead. If you can help people live in dignity, you can help bring, uh, bring peace. So this, uh, this brings us to the, the Middle East peace process, the process between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And like all protracted conflicts, it's also about living dignity. At the, uh, at the end of the day, the Jews, us, we want a homeland where we can live the way we want without anybody telling us how to live, to live free and to not be discriminated against our problems for being Jewish. And the Palestinians want the same thing. The Palestinians want to live in their homeland. And they want to be able to live the life the way they want to live and be free and not have anybody tell them how they, how they live. So at the end, that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to make sure that everybody can live uh, in peace with dignity and have a better life for their children. So that brings us to the different elements that we use as sort of the scorecard. So the first one is uh, borders that they talk about. So Israel wants defendable borders. For the Palestinians, they want contiguous. They want to be able to drive around their whole country without having to go through checkpoints, without having to go into Israel and come out, and you have to show your passport. So they want to be able to move around, even down to the, the Gaza Strip, which is a little more complicated, because there's a map back there. Because I remember how Israel looks, and you have the West Bank coming out, and then it's a sort of not the scale. But you know, you have the West Bank here, and the Palestinians are West Bank right here, and then there's like a little strip here next to Egypt, that's the Gaza Strip. So they didn't even like to be able to connect here. So they've talked about building a bridge so that you can just get on the road here and then get off there. Uh, Israel's a little worried about the defendability of a bridge because you can sort of attack people from a bridge. They've also talked about a tunnel, which would be really expensive. To go under, but it's also possible. So borders is always the first thing that they sort of talk about. Who who gets, you know, everybody sort of agrees that there should be a two-state solution, except for sort of the, the extremists on the side. But the question is, two states, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state side by side, but then what are the borders of those states? And then the final big issue is Jerusalem. So for Jerusalem, boy, it's all over. Because most of these, people generally know this, some of the details, but they generally know the solution because there's been a lot of negotiation about this over time. Matter of fact, there's something called the Geneva Initiative where the Palestinian negotiators and a whole bunch of Israelis acting privately got together and hammered out a deal and they all signed it just to prove the deal was possible. And they sort of know the borders because it's, you know, with some adjustments, it's generally clear when, where the Palestinians live. And then, but uh, Israel controls, you know, there's the, the occupied territories. For the refugees, they've generally agreed that it'll be some symbolic number. There's some disagreement over what the number should be. The security arrangements, it's a little, there's different ways to approach it, but it's solvable. But Jerusalem's a huge problem. Anyone know why that Jerusalem is such a big problem? Pretty cool. So, anyone else want to? You have raised your hand earlier. Yeah, um, because that, like, some people think it's their homeland and it's theirs to begin with, and then other people it's their homeland to begin with. And basically, Israel is home to a lot of different religions. It, it is home. That's, that's a lot of part of the, the big problem. Yeah. Um, it has to do with like borders because it's like in like the West Bank, 
Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's, I mean, you guys are, obviously, so the borders are a little tough throughout, but it's kind of clear what's, what's the West Bank in Gaza and what's Israel. And then Jerusalem is a city, it sort of looks like this, it's a big city. Um, so it's a pretty big city, and actually in Jerusalem itself is a city. It's actually pretty clear. There's there's a line. There's actually now a road that runs down a line. This was the line of control because between the, um, where where there was uh, a lot of fighting up until uh, 1967 when when Israel was able to take more land between 1948 and 1967, Israel only controlled up to this line, and these were where all the Arabs lived, and this is where all the Jews lived, and that line is still there, so it's pretty clear. Now, in the middle of the city, there's the old city, which is very beautiful. It's uh, several, you know, all the buildings you're looking at, there's one that's several thousand years old. And it's a little more complicated because people are living very close together. It's a little more mixed. But even in the old city, there is uh, neighborhoods that are definitely Jewish and neighborhoods that are definitely Palestinian. But there's one point in the old city. Anyone want to know what that one point in the old city that's the biggest problem? Exactly right, the Western Wall. So there's one point where you have the, the Western Wall, which is the retaining wall to hold up the hill where our temple stood. So it is, it is our holy spot. Well, the, uh, the temple stood there, and it is a spot where traditionally there's a rock where somebody was bound. Who knows the story of anyone else? Okay. It's when Abraham found Isaac. So that the temple was built over the spot where traditionally they say was the rock where Abraham found Isaac. You know, the, uh, the Muslims also revere Abraham. They, they look at Abraham as the founder of the Muslim religion too through uh, Isaac's older brother Ishmael. And actually in the Muslim story, uh, Abraham tied Ishmael, not Isaac, to the rock and almost sacrificed him. And so, and there's an actual rock there, uh, and they built a re the Muslims built a really beautiful uh, mosque on top of it there, with a golden dome on it. I've actually been lucky to, enough to be inside because I was working on the peace process. Because usually it's only Muslims that are allowed inside of it. And actually, it went inside, and they took us down under the mosque and saw the actual rock where they say that Abraham found Isaac. It's actually really neat. They call it the, the navel of the world. So. That spot is really holy, and it's the same spot because it's the, you know, the Western Wall is the wall that was uh, holding up the old temple. And so, unlike other places where you can say, "Well, this is your land and this is my land," it's really so close there. And you know, a lot of people have talked about one solution is to make it an international city, but actually, when Israel became independent, uh, the Israelis agreed to make it an international city and sort of backed off. And then the Arabs, when they attacked, took over the whole city. And between 1948 and 1967, Jews weren't allowed to go to the uh, Western Wall. They made the way on the wall. Because you could see it, but you couldn't pray on it. And it's pretty much our only holy spot. So it was, it was hard. And which is why people don't trust that if they agree to make it a national city, it'll work. Because we've lost credibility. Remember I said that you have to be credible. And a lot of people lost their credibility. So which brings us to the US wall. So the U.S. is an important actor in these negotiations. Well, we, uh, I, I, we are the only superpower, and I agree with you that because we have that power, that we are responsible. Because I think if you have the power to help people, uh, I believe that it's your responsibility to, to help them. And uh, it's, it's sort of what you said, and sort of not, in terms of neutral. It's not actually that we're neutral. It's that both sides trust us. To, uh, to help bring the peace. Because we actually favor Israel. We're very, this, US and Israel are as close as two countries can be. And uh, there's, there's no bigger supporter in the world uh, of, of Israel than the United States. But the Palestinians understand that, but they think that that is actually an advantage because they know that we also care about the Palestinians. They believe that we care about them too. Um, and they believe that as the only country that Israel trusts, 
that we can make, make sure that Israel agrees to a deal. Because uh, remember I said that diplomacy is about relationships and it's about trust. And both sides have to agree, have to believe that when they come to an agreement, the people will actually follow the agreement. So here in the US, we have judges, and we have police, and we have people that enforce contracts and agreements. But out in the world, there's, there's nothing like that. There's nobody to enforce the agreements. So you know, Israel is afraid that if they sign an agreement with the Palestinians, the Palestinians will cheat. And the Palestinians are afraid if they sign an agreement with the Israelis, that the Israelis will cheat. And so both sides trust the United States and they trust that we can get both sides to not cheat 